Okay, hi everybody. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the fourth extract from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Um, in this extract we see everything going from Dickens' descriptions of setting as he examines uh, Victorian London in the wintertime. We also see Scrooge's reaction to the carol singer and we'll be looking at everything just up to the moment when Marley's ghost appears. So as with the previous extracts that we've looked at, I'm going to be reading through the entire thing, pausing uh, at the end of each kind of section um, and going back and looking at some of the key quotations from within this part of the text. There's quite a lot of different ideas that we can look at within this, um, so you might want to watch this video in instalments or kind of come back and look at different bits um, if it's all too much to look at all in one go. Okay, so um, I'm just going to start with this first little section then and talk about setting. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible, and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some labourers were repairing the gas pipes and, has, and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, around which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing sullenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy the beef. Okay, so just looking at first of all at some of the quotations around setting. Within this part of the text we really see Dickens develop this freezing cold bitter atmosphere and he examines the relative differences in the lives of uh, the poor who are forced out into the cold and then those wealthier people who are preparing their Christmas celebrations in quite a different way. So first then, this line about the fog and darkness is interesting and I see this as Dickens beginning to develop a more mysterious atmosphere as we draw closer to the ultimate appearance of Marley's ghost. Fog in Victorian novels often uh, comes to symbolise a lack of clarity, people not seeing things clearly and as the darkness closes in with the fog uh, we're going to have this moment sharply contrasted with the appearance of the ghost who's going to reveal many things to Scrooge and give him a clarity about his own life. So we have this developing uh, mysterious, almost quite gothic atmosphere that Dickens is working on here. Furthermore, we have the appearance of this ancient tower of a church um, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge. And I think this is a really interesting use of personification. Dickens personifies the bell as gruff, almost grumpy, um, in order to convey the impression that it's watching Scrooge. It's described as peeping slyly down at him. Now, the bell is in a church, so we could interpret this as Scrooge's conscience. He feels observed. He thinks this bell is slyly peeping down at him. Um, as if it is watching him, as if it's observing his behaviour. In Christianity, uh, it is believed that God is always watching us, that he is aware of everything that we do. And if this is so, then he sees all of our sins, including Scrooge's. So when Scrooge looks up at this church bell and he believes that it's looking down at him, it's watching him, we might think of this as being symbolic of Scrooge's conscience that's beginning to pang. Okay, um... But he continues, Dickens continues, and describes uh, the bell striking the hours and quarters in the clouds and the vibrations of the bell afterwards, um, being almost as if the, the church's teeth were chattering in its frozen head. So he develops that personification. It's a really extended example of uh, personification. And it reminds us, it's as though even the buildings themselves are cold. And this desperate, biting cold... And the next line became intense. 
Now, why does Dickens bother banging on about the weather the entire time? Well, think about the examples of, of warmth and cold that we've seen so far. We see Scrooge with his little fire in his own office, keeping an eye on the even smaller fire that looks like just one coal which belongs to Bob Cratchit. So warmth is something that the wealthy are able to have, um, but those who are less well off, the, the lower working classes, the poor, for them warmth is such a luxury. And in a moment we see an example of people living on the street who have to make do with what little warmth they can find. So warmth becomes associated with generosity and the Christmas spirit, and Dickens plays with the ideas uh, of this here. By contrast, the cold is used to represent a lack of warmth, a lack of generosity, a lack of Christmas spirit. And we know that this is personified in Scrooge, who seems to carry the cold within him always, as Dickens describes in that first extract that we looked at. OK, so we move on and we see this image of some labourers who've repaired the gas pipes and that they've lighted a great fire. And we have a party of ragged men and boys huddling around it, desperate for warmth. Now, we can infer that these are some of the very poorest people living in the city. And remi a reminder here that Dickens uses this novel to critique the lack of generosity, the lack of kindness shown by the upper classes to those struggling to survive in the, in the country's cities, in London in particular. So here he's depicting the struggles of the poor. Despite the bitter cold, they're forced to warm themselves outside at a rough fire outdoors that's been lit by these labourers. So think about Scrooge keeping that fire in his own office. Think about keep the fact that he keeps an eye on how many coals uh, Bob Cratchit is allowed. Warmth and comfort is something that comes easily to the wealthy, but not to those who are less well off. And this is such a small comfort, really, isn't it? Think about, you know, the right to be warm is such a basic human need. Um, but here Dickens shows how it's denied to the worst off in society. And he, he clearly feels very strongly about that. OK, moving on then. Um, we have this image of the shops, the brightness of the shops with their Christmas decorations, which crackle in the lamp heat of the windows. Now, brightness, like warmth, is associated with the Christmas spirit. And Christmas casts this almost magical spell. The Christmas spirit passes from person to person and it, it, uh, it spreads this brightness and this warmth into passers-by. So Dickens writes that the brightness of the shops and the crackling of the lamp heat makes pale faces ruddy as they passed. So people passing by the shops go from pale and cold to ruddy in the face, meaning uh, their cheeks become flushed, they, they redden as they pass. So the word brightness associates the Christmas decorations with a light that spreads to the faces of the passers-by. So even in this bitter, biting cold, this kind of Christmas magic has the ability to warm the cheeks of passers-by. The Christmas spirit spreads through the population, and we get that sense that at Christmas time, improbable, impossible things become possible. Like, as we will later go on to see, the, the misanthropic, hateful, cruel, uh, antisocial, isolated Scrooge becoming warm and, and developing a love for his fellow man. OK. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. So we get the impression here that the wealthy are preparing or are spending their money quite freely, quite frivolously on poultry, so chickens and turkeys and things like that for their Christmas dinners and grocers. They're buying food in enormous quantities without a second thought in order to prepare these luxurious Christmas meals for themselves. So Dickens establishes the idea that Christmas is a time when the wealthy are able to spend freely on luxuries. He also suggests, though, that this is a glorious thing, it's a glorious pageant, um, as though there is a real delight and a wonder in, in these Christmas celebrations that people are putting together. He suggests it's not a time to be tight-fisted or miserly as Scrooge is, and we're reminded again of the charity workers who come to see Scrooge and they remind him that Christmas is a time when generosity of spirit is to be encouraged. So all of this is beginning to develop that idea that at Christmas time, generosity uh, from the, the wealthy towards the poor is really going to be an important and recurrent idea. OK, we'll move on. So... Foggier yet and colder, 
piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. So, even the frost is described here as being more congenial more agreeable in in nature than Scrooge's. Um, as to this poor carol singer, Scrooge has taken up a ruler as if to throw it at him, uh, causing him to run away in terror. So Scrooge's actions seem to attempt to banish the very idea of Christmas. It's as though he's disgusted by it. He's openly hostile to anyone that celebrates it or tries to tries to warm him with its spirit. He, he throws these people out. He tells Fred to leave. He tells Bob Cratchit that if he hears another word out of him in celebration of Christmas, he'll be fired. And now, uh, having already banished the charity workers, he is seizing the ruler to, to fling at this poor carol singer. So we get the impression that Scrooge, for some reason, hates the festive season. And as the novel progresses, we will start to see some of the reasons why he has become so hostile to this time of year. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. "'You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose,' said Scrooge. "'If quite convenient, sir.' "'It's not convenient,' said Scrooge, "'and it's not fair. "'If I was to stop half a crown for it, "'you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound.' The clerk smiled faintly. "'And yet,' said Scrooge, "'you don't think me ill-used "'when I pay a day's wages for no work.' The clerk observed that it was only once a year. "'The poor man's excuse for picking a man's coat pocket "'every 25th of December,' said Scrooge, "'buttoning his greatcoat to the chin. "'But I suppose you must have the whole day. "'Be here all the earlier next morning.' The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill, at the end of a lane of boys, twenty times, in honour of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. Okay, let's just have a quick look at the end of this conversation then between Scrooge and Bob Cratchit. Um, Scrooge saying you'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, means I assume you want the whole day off for Christmas. Um, And Bob very politely responds, if quite convenient. But Scrooge is frustrated by this because he'll still be paying Bob his wages. Um, And we see it isn't very much. It's a half a crown, so not really a huge amount of money for a single day's work. Um, Bob says, well, it is only once a year. And Scrooge refers to this as a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. So he actively feels robbed by the fact that he must pay Bob Cratchit a day's wages on this day when he won't be working. Um, As a consequence, he tells Bob to be there all the earlier the next morning. So on Boxing Day, he's supposed to come in early. So we see his resentful nature. He resents having to pay Bob Cratchit's salary for Christmas Day. He feels he shouldn't have to do it because Bob won't be working. And this really emphasises his lack of kindness, his lack of empathy at this stage in the story. He perceives Christmas as a wasteful luxury. He has no respect, no regard for the fact that Bob will be spending this day with his family because it is not an experience that he shares. He simply sees it in his obsession with work and the accumulation of wealth. He simply sees it as a as a waste of money that he should pay Bob uh, this day when he won't be he won't be working. So moving on, we see this really interesting comparison between the way that Bob celebrates Christmas Eve and the way that Scrooge doesn't. Um, Bob goes down a slide at Cornhill um, 20 times in honour of its being Christmas Eve, then runs home to his family in Camden Town in order to go and play Christmas games with them. So Dickens illustrates Bob's playful, light-hearted nature. He celebrates Christmas Eve very cheerfully with a childlike celebration sliding down a hill. And not only does he do this once, he does it 20 times. This isn't something that he does under duress or because he feels he has to. It's something that he does out of sheer joy for the Christmas season. 
Despite his harsh treatment by Scrooge, he maintains his festive spirit, and then he runs home to be with his family. And the idea of a grown man running home as hard as he could again has a childishness to it, again illustrates his lack of concern for how he's perceived by others and shows that really his only concern is getting home to be with the ones that he loves because finally he has been freed from Scrooge's freezing cold office and he's about to return somewhere warmer, somewhere where he is loved and cherished and respected. By contrast, Scrooge is alone. He's isolated, and he eats his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. So, by contrast, he's solitary, and he spends his Christmas Eve in quite a sombre, quite a gloomy way. He doesn't go home to a family to eat, so he eats out in a tavern. Um, And we see this repetition of the word melancholy, which literally just means sad. And this really is juxtaposed with Bob's joyful sprint home to be with his family. The happiness of the poor man is contrasted with the misery of the wealthy one. By Scrooge's logic, his wealth should bring him happiness. But it doesn't, because he's lacking in all of those things that truly make people happy. A family, to be loved, to be around people, to have friends, to be respected. None of these things are possibilities for Scrooge. He reads all the newspapers for something to do and spends the rest of his evening with his banker's book, What a Christmas Eve Scrooge Has. Let's continue to read. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with other houses and forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms all being let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The frost and fog, uh, sorry, the fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threat on the threshold. So it's almost as though the weather itself has created this particularly dark, particularly foggy, particularly frosty atmosphere. Um, Of course, it's Dickens that's doing all of these things. It's not some coincidence. And he particularly constructs this dark, foggy, mysterious, enigmatic atmosphere in which Scrooge, who knows the way home really, really well, has to grope with his hands. So he's feeling his way home, touching the walls. Um, And this darkness, this lack of clarity, reflects the fact that Scrooge does not see things clearly at this point in time and he is about to be made to see things clearly by the apparition of the spectre, the spirit of Marley. So Dickens continues developing this mysterious, almost gothic atmosphere using pathetic fallacy to do so. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place, Also, that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation aldermen and livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the locker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, Not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face! It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That, and its livid colour, made it horrible, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. So, this is beginning to foreshadow the ultimate appearance of Marley's ghost. Dickens kind of drip-feeds these mysterious supernatural occurrences, these mysterious apparitions, um, leading up to the to the big one, the main appearance of Marley. So he insists upon the the, the kind of the ordinariness of the day. Um, everything seems absolutely ordinary. 
And Dickens insists upon this again and again and again in order to highlight the extraordinary nature of what is about to happen. And he highlights it as if to point out that this is in fact a Christmas miracle. He notes here that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy as any man in London. So meaning that Scrooge is not prone to daydreaming or imagining things. This is purely uh, a supernatural apparition, a supernatural occurrence that is taking place. It's not a hallucination. So this, unlike, you know, the dagger that Macbeth hallucinates outside Duncan's chambers, there is no chance of this being a trick of the mind. This is something that is truly taking place. Um, and notice as well, we might at first think that this is a trick of the light, except that Dickens is so specific in the details. This is everything that uh, that Scrooge is seeing himself. So Dickens toys with the conventions of the ghost story, and here again is foreshadowing that greatest of all of these supernatural occurrences, Marley's ghost coming back to visit Scrooge. Okay. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy, would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause, with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on, so he said, poo poo and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. So, Dickens just starts to reveal to us in these lines. He did pause and he did look cautiously. He just begins to hint to us that Scrooge is feeling slightly uncomfortable, that he is aware that something odd is happening and he has that slight uh, sensation of a shiver running down his spine. Half of him is expecting something strange to happen, but he reminds himself when he sees the very dull and ordinary fact that there's nothing behind the door except the screws and nuts that hold the knocker on, he says poo-poo, meaning what nonsense. So he sort of... Uh, tuts at himself for having had this moment of, of what he thinks of as daydreaming. However, as he slams the door, we have this echoing sound that resounds through the house like thunder. And here this simile starts to play again with these gothic conventions. The referencing of thunder starts to hint again a pathetic fallacy, that idea of using the weather, using uh, nature and natural uh, uh, effects in order to convey a particular mood. We have strange sounds foreshadowing this ghostly appearance and the association of that stormy weather with these supernatural events. So we have this loud echoing sound and again this does nothing to put Scrooge's mind at rest. Dickens begins to develop this ghostly gothic atmosphere and we kind of as readers we start to look forward with anticipation to what this is all building towards. We have the suspense, we have the tension, um, we have Scrooge's slight growing sense of fear um, as he heads up the stairs and we know just from the way that this is building up to something that when he gets to his room something is going to happen. So let's continue. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs or through a bad young act of parliament, but I mean to say that you might have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadwise with the splinter bar towards the wall and the door towards the balustrades and done it easy. There was plenty of width for that and room to spare, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lighted up the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip, his candle. So, apologies for my mispronunciation of hearse there for the moment. Um, Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Now, this is a really fleeting uh, image, and Dickens doesn't dwell on it. But let's just appreciate for a moment the fact that Scrooge thinks he has seen a hearse passing up the stairs in front of him. And this is a really clear symbol of death. Literally, a hearse is the, the vehicle that conveys, that carries a coffin. Um, and this image connects the appearance of Marley's ghost with the later vision, much later in the novel, of Scrooge's own eventual death. It creates that sense of awareness, that reminder that death comes to us all. 
And we have that sense perhaps that uh, time is ticking away really for Scrooge. Marley has died, Scrooge is no young man, and he will be starting, or we begin as readers, starting to think about uh, the time that he has left in which to change for the better. Um, and this is obviously the major theme of the novel, the transformation and the redemption of a truly sinful and wicked man as he becomes a good one and a kind one because of what is about to take place. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. The face, of course, being Marley's face. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, a small fire in the great spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel, Scrooge had a cold in his head, upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual, old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. So, a couple of things to pick out here. Look at the repetition. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in his dressing gown. Now, this repetition is... Uh, I think a little gentle touch of Dickensian humour. The repetition illustrate, illustrating Scrooge checking everything over. Um, it's used to build suspense, of course, because we are about to see that, in fact, Scrooge is not alone in his home. Um, so it's building that suspense before the moment of the apparition. But also it starts to just hint to us that Scrooge is perhaps not so unafraid as he seems to hint. Things are not all as they should be because he's checking all over his rooms to make sure that there's nobody else there. Notice as well, Scrooge had a cold in his head. Now, and he's taking some gruel as a result of this. Could this perhaps be to do with the fact that Scrooge is so constantly and continually uh, chilly because he doesn't spend any extra money on coal for his fire? Perhaps. Now, look at this. Quite satisfied, having checked all of his rooms, that is, he closes his door and locks himself in. He double locks himself in, which is not his custom. It's not his habit to do so. So the fact that he is double locking the door again suggests to us that that slight fear, that slight sense of unease is creeping in. OK, we'll continue. Scrooge has sat down before his fire. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on a bit, such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. So, just notice for a moment, Scrooge even seems to restrict his expenditure, his spending, on himself. He doesn't even uh, allow himself a nice roaring fire, even though he can afford one, when he's freezing cold and has a cold, and is sitting there waiting to warm up. So he has to sit right up close to his fire, and wait and wait before he begins to warm up. Um, so this shows really what a miser he is. He's not even generous with himself. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles, designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Belshazzar's, apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts. And yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Humbug, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose, now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment, and with a strange, inexplicable dread, that as he looked he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. Now, up until this moment, Scrooge has been able to dismiss any hints of a ghostly presence. He double locks his door and he thinks that he is safe. But this is unmistakable. This is not like the appearance of Marley's face in the knocker, which, although it is playing on his mind, he could maybe, maybe tell himself he imagined. This is a bell ringing loudly and clearly. Um, 
and every bell in the house joins in. So Dickens has, up until this point, continually emphasised how rational Scrooge's mind is, how ordinary his day has been. This event is made all the more extraordinary. So we have, first of all, the apparition of Marley's face in the door knocker. Second of all, his imagining that he sees a hearse on, in front of him on the stairs. And then finally, this ringing of the bells. And remember, when we were looking at Dickens' description of setting, the image of the bell in the church tower was described as peeping down at Scrooge. And we thought that it might perhaps be used to, to symbolise his conscience. Well, now every bell in the house is ringing out loudly, and Scrooge is not able to escape the pangs of his conscience anymore, because Marley's ghost is about to manifest and really, really make his conscience pain him. This might have lasted half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun, together. They were succeeded, they were replaced, by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. Now, this chain, this ominous sound, will later be shown to symbolise the weight of Marley's sins. The carrying of a similar chain will become Scrooge's own fate if he does not change his ways. So just like the ringing of the bell being used to symbolise conscience, we have this heavy chain and the sound of its rattle representing Scrooge's ultimate fate to be kind of condemned to this purgatorial state uh, because of the sins that he has committed in his life. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His colour changed, though, when without a pause it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. So... Um, right up until he sees the ghost walk through the door that he has double locked against any intruder, Scrooge tries to tell himself, it's humbug still, it's nonsense. So despite his attempts to convince himself that this cannot be happening, Scrooge is ultimately confronted with this supernatural apparition that is Marley's ghost, and the sight terrifies him, as emphasised as his colour changed, all the colour drains from his face. Okay. So uh, we will leave uh, this extract there. In our next video, I'll be looking a little bit more closely, a bit more in depth at Marley's ghost itself and what it has to say to Scrooge. I hope that this has been useful for you. I appreciate that this has been a long video um, and you may wish to kind of fast forward and speed through bits that are not relevant to you or that you don't need to know. But hopefully this has given you a really good grounding in how Dickens uses setting and how he builds tension in stave one. Okay, thanks very much for listening and good luck with your revision.